And there are real impediments to that. Because right now, the direction we're headed is not the right direction. It's not. We're not headed in the right direction domestically when it comes to our economy. You know, I want to be fair about this. Leaders of both parties made a mistake. They thought, we can now be a country that only invents things. We don't have to make things anymore. And we are learning that when you don't make things, even if you invented them, someone else will make them. And you'll depend on them for it. And that's why today, 80-something percent of the medicines we take are made in China. <coughs> increasingly dependent on other places, we lose our industrial capacity. And that's not just a threat to our economy, that's a threat to good jobs, these are good paying jobs. And you can't have a strong country if you don't have good paying jobs, because without good paying jobs, you're not gonna have strong families, you're not gonna have strong communities. It's also a national security threat. Imagine if, right now you're about to go into conflict, imagine if Japan made our airplanes in 1939 to 1941, we'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> right? Imagine if we depended on Germany for our tanks, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Well, right now we depend on too many other places for everything from energy to pharmaceuticals to the ability to, to make heavy machinery that we need for farming and for agriculture. By the way, that's another one that people forgot. Maybe the pandemic, I think the pandemic reminded a lot of people that food doesn't come from the grocery store. It comes out of the ground because someone is, is growing it for them. Someone is producing it for them. We need to protect our agriculture industry and our country. If you can't feed yourself, none of this other stuff matters. I don't care how great an app that you design. If you can't produce food for your population, you're in a lot of trouble. These are things that we can We need more people that understand that about our economy. We've been headed in the wrong direction. And Bernie Moreno understands this because he's created jobs. He's created opportunity by taking risks. The same is true with our national security. Look, the Chinese look at the world and say, okay, America designed all the rules of the world after World War II, after the Cold War, but now we're almost as powerful as you. We want to rewrite these rules and we want to do it to our advantage. I want to be frank with you. I want to be straight with you. The Chinese watch our news, read our websites, and they say, these people are falling apart. They've lost their minds. We will soon lead them both. They openly say this to other countries. When they send their people to meet with leaders, they say, look, we all know that we're going to be the most powerful country here soon. You guys are watching what's happening in America. So you might as well start going in our direction. And now we've got junior partners. The Russians have signed up for it, the Iranians, the North Koreans. So we face real threats around the world. This is not 1991 where we're the only superpower on the planet. And that means we have to be very judicious and very pragmatic about where and how we engage in the world. There are things we have to do in the world and things that we would like to do. Right now we have to focus on things we have to do in the world, which is to keep America safe. If we don't have a limited resources, we never have We had a lot of people that come from other countries. So when I speak about this topic of immigration, illegal immigration, I didn't read about it in a book. I wasn't given some briefing. I didn't read some five-part series or watch some frontline documentary. I know the people that are coming. I know the people that are bringing their families. Okay? I, I got three days ago, two days ago, some lady comes up and says, oh, you just brought my relatives. How'd you do it, Ida? She says, well, I just sent all the money to some guy. Ten grand, ten grand. And they helped them over in, in and maybe they've been here a couple months, but generally, you know, at some point in time in the near, uh, in the near past that that happened. And why is that happening? It's happening is we're not, we have an administration that refuses, refuses to enforce our immigration laws. Understand this, okay? Every year, a million people legally, about a million people a year legally get a green card. They wait sometimes 17 years and they get a green card. No country in the world is that generous. So I'm talking about on top of that. Now, if tomorrow you announce, guess what? We have no more border. Anyone who wants to come should come. 100 million people will come. 100 million people will come. Okay, that's crazy. We have no, country, no country can assume 100 million people. You have a right as a country to control who comes in, how they come in, when they come in. You have to have a process. And if you don't enforce that process, you don't have a process. And we are stuck now with at least one partner in this country who supports open borders. Don't ever call it that, but that's what they support. When you say, basically, we will not enforce our immigration laws, when you basically say this, if you get to our border, all you have to do is say the magic words and claim asylum, you're going to be allowed in, you're going to be released, people are going to come. The word spreads fast. It's all incentive-based. Now, I'll acknowledge this to you, okay? The overwhelming majority of the people have crossed that border illegally. They're violating our laws, but they're not, they, they, want, you know, they want a job, they want to take their family out of a terrible situation. I understand it. 
There are other countries that can take you too, by the way. It doesn't have to be America. But I want you to think about this. Let's just say 1%, 1% of the people that are coming illegally are a terrorist, a gang member, a career criminal. Just 1%. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people when you're talking about 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 million people. 1% of that, that is a lot of criminals, a lot of terrorists, and a lot of danger to the country. Not to mention the strain that it puts on communities. You have cities in America right now that basically have had for months been renting hotel rooms yeah. to put people up. Schools, hospitals, the criminal justice system, everything is overcrowded. We can't continue down this road. And that's the road that we're on right now based on the Biden-Harris administration. Because I have, you know, is anybody here from the media? Is there media in the media yet? I'm not signaling them out, okay? Like, I don't want you to get angry. I'm saying the media, I want them to know this. Kamala Harris was not born on July 24th of 2024. She existed before July 24th. <laughs> she happened to be the Vice President of the United States when all of these decisions were being made by this administration. And it's time people start covering that. She was there. She was there when they were making these decisions. She supported them. And she sold them. I've never seen something like the last six weeks. It's like they're pretending she didn't exist. She just emerged from the heat. She was there for all these decisions. And that's why this race is so important. Okay? I believe that Donald Trump's going to win Ohio, right? <laughs> Elected. If he wins Ohio and the Democrats keep the, Democrats keep the Senate, what is the point? Because there's nothing he wants to do to get this country right that he'll be able to do in a Senate that's controlled by Chuck Schumer. On the contrary, on the contrary, we've already seen what they've done in the past when they've had the majority of the votes in both chambers. They put us through two impeachments. They put us through blocking this and that and the other. I mean, they, they, it's, it's nothing he wants to achieve will work. If you're gonna vote for Donald Trump in Ohio, you better vote for Bernie Moreno. So that's the only thing you can do. But obviously, you know now it's in your hands. When this vote is starting? A month? Less than a month? Four weeks? So I'm guessing, I don't know this for sure, I haven't talked to anybody that's walked in, but I'm guessing that most of you are probably gonna have voted and vote for Bernie and for Trump, right? Yeah. <laughs> Primarily because of your hat and your shirt. <laughs> but all of you know someone that will do the same thing. But they're probably not going to vote unless you get them to go vote. Okay? Because they don't live obsessed. Like they don't spend all night. I'm not saying you guys do this. I'm just saying. I know people that watch, you know, the television is always on this and they're watching on that. And they're very engaged in politics and watch it constantly. And then there are some people that care, they're aware, but I mean, you know, they got stuff going on. Kids to raise, jobs to do, businesses to run, college football to watch, you know, important things like this, <laughs> vital to the future of our country. And, um, and so it's not that they don't care about politics, it's just that, you know, they have other priorities that are going on. And election day will come and sneak up on them and they're like, oh, I forgot to go vote. So what I tell everybody everywhere, especially in places where we know races are going to be close, because that's the nature of American politics is, you know people that agree with us but probably will not go vote unless you make sure they do, unless you remind them, unless you're on top of it. We all do, we all need three or four people like that. And that's what we have to do as well. You wanna make a difference in the race, that's what we have to go do, is we have to make sure those people come out and vote. Because I'm telling you, if those people come out and vote, we're gonna win here, and we're gonna have the majority. We will have the majority, and hopefully we'll win in some other places, and the majority in the Senate will be three or four, not just one, it's a narrow margin all the time. But it's really, really important that we win. I mean, what's at stake is extraordinary. And you know, every election people say that, but I can honestly tell you that when you look at what are the things that are being talked about now, like Chuck Schumer basically said, if we get the majority, we are gonna get rid of the filibuster, which is a Senate procedure. You may say, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that they will be able to pass any law they want with either 50 votes and the vice president or 51 votes. Now, what does that mean? It means that every crazy idea that you can think of that has already passed in the House when the Democrats were in charge, whether they talk about now, every one of these, will become the law of this country. They'll be able to pass all of them because there won't be a 60 vote requirement. They'll just be able to pass it. And so we are basically not, no, we're no longer gonna be talking about the crazy things the left would do if they got power. We're gonna be living in a country where those things will have happened, where they will have happened. So we have, that's why this is so critical and important. Beyond the fact that you have a chance not just to elect someone that helps us reclaim the majority, but someone who I think brings to the position of the Senate what we need more of. 
And that is people in touch with the real life of planet Earth. What would life is like for real people? What is life for businesses that are trying to build and hire? What is life for working people that are trying to make a living and deal with the cost of living? What we actually need our government to do or not do in order to allow it to allow our economy to create the jobs and opportunities that we need in our country. So you have a chance not just to elect someone that helps us have the majority, but someone that I honestly believe will be a meaningful, impactful senator and national leader on these issues, who brings that life experience and that toughness and, uh, and I think the right combination of youth and energy, and life and work experience, that positions them to really lead very quickly and be a, a real asset to our team in the Senate and to the country. That's what you have an opportunity to do here, and that's why it was so important for me to come and do everything I can to help them win. And, uh, um, and, and so I hope that you'll do everything you can to help them win, because it's important. It's important for the future of our country. It's important for the immediate future of our country, and it's important for our children and grandchildren. We are deciding what kind of country they will inherit. And we are deciding whether we're going to be the next Americans to leave their children and grandchildren better off, or the first Americans to leave their children and grandchildren worse off. I don't want to be the first Americans to leave the next generation worse off. I want to be like the Americans before us, leave our children and our grandchildren with a safer and a stronger country, with more opportunity. I want our children and our grandchildren to be the freest and the most prosperous Americans that have ever lived. We have a chance to do that, and you have a chance to do that by electing our next U.S. Senator from Ohio, the next member of our Republican team, Bernie Moreno. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Rubio, for coming up. I told him we're going to make him jealous of Florida weather. Why? Look at this. It's so much better. All right? We're going to come to Ohio for good weather. So thank you for being here. Before I begin, uh, Bridget, we can stand up real quick. I uh, embarrass my wife. Uh, Bridget and I have been married 35 years. And I can legitimately tell you I've, won, I've hit the lottery twice in my life. True story. Hit the lottery twice. Once when I married Bridget 35 years ago. And the second time when my parents brought me to America. Now, this is why I'm running. This is why I'm running. Because look, the country that my parents came to, Maybe it's the same country that your, your parents came to or your great-grandparents came to. It's a special place on Earth, and I think Senator Rubio just said it beautifully. So what's our job? We've got to make it better. Now, I can, I can tell you this. I've been around the car business uh, one way or another since I went to uh, work for General Motors as a kid. When I worked for Saturn Corporation, we talked about kind of reimagining the car business. And it wasn't, listen, every uh, stereotype is earned in some way. And the car business was a rough and tumble business in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And Saturn was a part of changing that. The reason I'm telling you that is because I've seen fake BS in my life. <laughs> Nothing like politics. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> like politics. You got a guy, Sherrod Brown, who is the most artificial human brand I've ever seen in my life. This is a guy who wakes up takes his suit, gets it all wet, puts it in a dryer, gets it all ruffled, takes his white blow dryer, messes up his hair, and then pretends to be a working class American. This is a guy who says he went to, I went to high school with the, uh, you know, the sons of carpenters, and then he goes to like a list, he like Googled blue collar jobs, and just starts reading them, right? And I want to say to him so badly, yeah, those are the kids that beat you up in high school, Sherry. <laughs> All right? Because you were the rich kid that grew up in Mansfield going to the country club, was a full pay student to Yale, right? Pretends he's an Ohio guy, and majored in Russian studies. Yeah. So you can't even make that up. Now, you'll never hear that in the media because the media loves Sherry. There is a love affair there between Sherry and his wife, who works in the media, not worked in the media, works there now. Think about conflicts of interest. His wife currently works for Gannett, who owns most of the newspapers in Ohio. Do you think that there's some camaraderie there that leads to stories being framed? So anyway, this guy's got this persona. He went into elected office for the first time. Richard Nixon was in the White House. Like Richard Nixon, like that guy. And he's been in elected office his whole life and talks about the dignity of work. How would he know? <laughs> like, when I want to ask him, so I'm like, Jared, how do you know what it's like to wake up and have to go out and struggle for a paycheck? Have to actually 
work and accomplish something to be able to provide for your family. He has no idea. For 50 years, this guy's lived a coddled life of an elected official. He pretends he's for the working man. Now that's where him and I have 100% agreement. I think what we have to do in this country is build our, and have a growing and thriving middle class. If you were to ask me what's different from Columbia, South America to the United States of America, what's different? And I'll tell you that in Columbia, there's a very small group of people that are wealthy, and there's everybody else that are very, very poor. And there's no movement one way or the other. If you're born rich, you can try all you want, you're gonna stay that way. If you're born poor, you can try all you want, you're gonna stay there. It's a growing and thriving middle class. So how do we do that? How do we create a middle class like my father-in-law? Best example that I can think of that's close to me. This is a guy who grew up in a tough environment, graduated from high school, reported to work at U.S. Steel, worked there his whole life until he transferred to Cincinnati to work for AK Steel, saw firsthand what happens when foreign companies buy American companies. A company gets destroyed until it gets saved, thankfully, by Cleveland Cliffs. But now he lives in Westchester, Ohio, debt-free, with a government that, for the most part, left him alone, allowed him to afford a home, raise three kids in a safe community. That is the American dream. That's what makes America unique. You see, that doesn't exist in most of the countries on Earth. So Sharon will talk about helping the working class. So let's go through his rank. Because I consider this to be a job interview. You have two candidates in front of you looking for a job, right? I'm asking for you to hire me by voting for me to represent you in the United States. I can look at my track record, started with one dealership not too far from here, probably 10 miles from here. Bought that dealership with every single cent I had in my life. Every cent. Maxed out my credit cards, sold every possession I had. In fact, I still don't wear a watch because I literally sold a watch off my arm to buy that dealership. Every night, I would go to bed. I'd wake up around two or three in the morning in a cold sweat. My wife would say, you okay? I said, oh, yeah, great. <laughs> I was doing numbers, I didn't want her to know what was going on. I'm doing numbers in my head. Do I have enough cash to survive today? Will I be able to meet payroll? Now, I was able to get past all of that, build a successful business because we had a great team of people around me. In fact, very proud that that first dealership, we had 20 team members. Six of them now currently run six different dealerships. Very proud of that. We grew our people and provided them enormous opportunities. Sharon has no idea what it's like to own or run a small business. She has no idea what it's like to be accountable for work. To be accountable for work, meaning you work for somebody, where you have to actually perform. So let's look at Israel. He ran for office in 1992. You know what is the core message, Lisa, of his campaign was in 1992 to run for wash office in Washington, D.C.? Term limits. <laughs> he ran on term limits. He said, we gotta get these guys out of there. These guys that have been there forever, right? They're all crooks. That was in 1992. Now he wants six more years for a total of 56 years. Right? This is nuts. Now, he said he was going to restore American manufacturing. He was going to bring manufacturing back to Ohio, which, by the way, we have to do. Look, the statistic Senator Rubio may not know that in 1949, six of the wealthiest 14 cities in the United States of America were in Ohio. Six of the wealthiest 14 cities Lorraine, Youngstown, Akron, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton. Great manufacturing beacons for this country. Crushed by terrible industrial policy from both parties, honestly. So Sharon says he's gonna change that. What's happened? So somebody comes and applies to you and says, hey, I'm gonna do this for you. What's he done? 200,000 plus manufacturing jobs lost since he went to Washington, D.C. Under his watch. How can you be for working class Americans, by the way? when you're for unrestricted, unfeathered, illegal immigration that lowers American wages. Do you think that having 10 to 12 million illegals in America is causing us to have higher wages? Of course not. When you're in a place like Springfield, Ohio, where you've got 20, they now think maybe even 30,000 Haitians shipped there by the US government, 
You know what that's doing to housing costs in Springfield, Ohio? You know, Kamala Harris, this imaginary creature that's now called Kamala Harris, she says we have to build three million new homes in America. By the way, who's the we? I'm not sure. But she, she evidently is going to go into the home building business. What could go wrong when the government gets involved in that? Well, do you think maybe we wouldn't have a housing crisis? We didn't have 12 million extra people in this country that are competing for housing? Right? That's what's driving up housing costs. You look at insurance costs. Look at rent. Look at your credit card payments. When your energy bill is outrageous, my daughter's house, I think is what do you think, somewhere around 98 degrees in her house. Right? Because she she literally she she has a great job. Her husband has a great job. I love visiting them. But I have to spend most of my time outside because they won't turn the damn air conditioning on. Because they live in New York, where of course it's all green energy mandates. Her electricity, are you ready for this? Her electricity bill nine hundred dollars a month. Nine hundred grand. Why? Because we're gonna have windmills and solar panels that power our economy. Right? So of course we shut down coal mines. Sharon wears a little lapel pin with the canary to coal mine, which is the most ironic thing he does. Because you know what that means, right? The canary saying, hey, this guy's killing coal miners. Right? <laughs> He's killing their jobs. And it's like you're wearing it, bragging because look, what do we do? We have shut down our coal industry in America while China has built theirs. We share the same planet. <laughs> Who do you think is stricter than US EPA or the Chinese EPA? What's better for the planet? More coal mines in America or more, more coal mines in China? And of course, now he wants to go after natural gas. Now, I don't know, maybe it's a grammar error where you say, I definitely want to ban fracking. It's a grammar error that means she won't ban fracking. Now, English was my second language, but I'm pretty certain that actually means you're gonna ban fracking. It could be that you're lying, Kamala, that you're actually gonna ban fracking. By the way, if you ban fracking, my daughter's $900 electricity bill is probably gonna be $5,000. Because you, this is what's powering our economy today. Now, what do they wanna do? They want us all driving electric vehicles. I've sold a lot of cars in my life. In my office, when I owned that dealership, it was right in the show. When the phone rang twice, a human would answer it. The third ring would ring in my office. Because I put myself accountable with my clients. I never had one client in my entire life that walked into the showroom and said, Bernie, I like this red car. I like this kind of cool little convertible. It looks pretty good. But I'm concerned. What kind of car does Sherrod want me to buy? <laughs> Not once. Never had that. But now they want us driving electric vehicles, driving up the cost of internal combustion engine cars. The average price car today is 50 grand. The average car payment is over $650 a month for a new car. Used cars are incredibly unaffordable. The price up almost 49% because of their policies. How can you be for the working man when you're advocating policies that make it impossible to own a home, impossible to own a car, impossible to pay rent, credit card payments that crush you? You know, it's not that things are more expensive, it's that the dollar's less value. That's what they've done. They've lowered the value of the United States dollar. Now, you know what country did that perfectly? Venezuela. So much so, they lowered their currency to a value where it was what they used to heat their homes. They would take the money and just put it in the furnace, and that's what produced heat. Because the, the Venezuelan peso became basically completely worthless. That's what they're doing to us. Look, when Sharon started, we had $3 trillion in debt in this country. Trillion. It's 35 today. I was talking, I'll give you a couple of stories, and this is what's really important about what I'm doing in this campaign. Bridget and I made a decision when we launched this campaign, we're going to go to every single corner of Ohio, talk to people and understand what is on your mind. I'll tell you a story. Just yesterday, uh, Dom and uh, some of the guys put together a great event over in uh, North, North uh, in, what was it, Rexville? Rodney Heights, see, this is all over Ohio. And a veteran came up to me afterwards, a veteran, let me see, he may even be here, he said he was gonna, I don't see him. John, a veteran came up, so he, he goes to the VA for treatment. And he goes to the VA over in Wade Oval. He said they, they had a flood and their CT scanner broke nine months ago. He can't get a scan there. He has to drive an hour and a half to go get a scan, a veteran. 
put the uniform on and serve this country. I don't know what a CT scanner costs, but it's not $300 billion, which is what we want to send to Ukraine to fight another endless war. Right now, listen, I believe that America needs to play a leadership role in the world, but you see what Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and Sheriff Brown, they want to drag this war out forever. It should never have happened, and by the way, it would never have happened if President Trump was in the White House. What we should have done is been the I've I had many members of the Ukrainian community that have talked to me. We actually won Parma and Parma Heights by nine points in the primary because see, my position is very simple. I want to end the death of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. I want to get to a peaceful settlement. Now, is it a good situation? No. Because again, it should never have happened. But the point is, what's your priority? A CT scanner for veterans in Cleveland, Ohio, or a $230 million pier in Gaza that sinks into the sea? You tell me. What do you want me to spend money on? $451 billion to house illegal immigrants and take care of them? Or take care of Americans? You look at, if I asked you in this room, how many of you serve this country in the United States military? Please raise your hand. Can we give them all a huge round of applause? We have 35,000 homeless vets in America today. 35,000 in the wealthiest country on earth, the greatest country on the planet. These are people who serve their country, put their lives at risk, and do not have the dignity of a home. If we took one one hundredth of what we spent on illegals last year, we could have built each of them a home. You talk to me about priorities in this country. When you're taking Social Security, like Sherrod Brown is, and saying, let's raise the retirement age, let's cut benefits, because we've got to save the program. How about stop giving it to illegals? How about stop robbing the medical Security? <laughs> In the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, where Sheriff Brown was a tie-breaking vote, you can say it's Kamala Harris, but if Sheriff Brown had voted no, it wouldn't have passed. They took $300 million out of Medicare. You know what they did with it? Diane, you know what they did with it? They used it to fund electric vehicle mandates. Process that for a second. We have a government that wants to have our seniors decide between rent, the drugs they need to live, so that we can have millionaires lease electric vehicles. Think about how insane that is. This is Sheriff Brown's record. Now, he can't run on that, by the way. By the way, neither can Kamala Harris. There's so many similarities there. As Sheriff Brown's own words say, he loves Kamala Harris for so many reasons. They're identical. They're all frauds. Kamala Harris is trying to convince us that she's running against Biden. Right? She's running against the current president. Right? She's somebody who is this bipartisan, moderate, that's going to bring joy. It's going to bring joy. Right? Let me tell you another story on a campaign trip. I went to a place, uh, Delaware, Ohio. Similar to Independence. And then a gentleman, we did Q&A, he stands up. He takes a receipt, you'll love this, Senator Ruby. He takes a receipt out of his pocket. He stands up, this big guy. I kind of reminded me of my father-in-law. I got a little nervous when I saw him. And he looked at me and he goes, I got one question for you, son. You answer it right, you got my vote. You answer it wrong, I'm out of here. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Um, <laughs> he looked at the receipt and he goes, two large french fries and a strawberry milkshake, large, and McDonald's. How much? Well, Hold on. So I'm dressed like this. I'm dressed like this, right? So I look at him and I go, I think you probably think I eat fancy meals. But let me tell you something. I eat my meals at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, and usually it's three places I go to in order of preference. Taco Bell, I am Hispanic. <laughs> Sheets, and then because I'm not under 40, last ditch McDonald's, because you know, once you get to a certain age, your body just says, uh-uh, right? <laughs> and he's my age, so I'm looking at him going, I know you don't go to McDonald's. And he goes, no, it's what my son asked me to get him, but you're avoiding the question, how much? I said, well, it's a trick question. Because not every McDonald's is priced the same, but generally speaking, that's going to cost you between 14 and 15 bucks. He looks at me, looks at the receipt, looks at me, looks at the receipt, goes, 14.37, you got my vote. <laughs> now, the point of the story isn't that he wanted to be a jerk, you see. The 
The point of the story is that four years ago, that used to be $7. Imagine what it feels like. Just for a second. This is something that Sheriff will never understand. Imagine what it feels like to have your teenage son call you and say, hey, Dad, on the way home from second shift, you get me two large fries and a large strawberry milkshake. Imagine what it feels like to be a 57-year-old man who followed the rules, worked hard for your whole life, showed up to work, did your job, raised your family the right way, and you have to answer and say, I can't afford it. I can't do it, son. I don't have the money. And then he goes home, turns on the TV, $100 billion in this country, $50 billion to this country, $400 billion to the illegals. You cross the country, skip the line of people like I came here, you get a hotel room in New York City for $6,000 a month. You don't like the food? Oh, no problem. How about if we just give you a prepaid debit card? You don't pay a health care premium? No health care premium, zero. You're an illegal immigrant in this country. Zero health care premium with zero deductible, zero copay. You don't have to worry about whether you're in or out of the network. You look at that, what did I do wrong? Why does my government hate me? That's the question that he was really asking. And he's 100% right. We have a government that is so disconnected from the average voter that they don't live in the same planet. They live in a bubble called Washington, D.C., where things are normal there, are not normal here in Independence, Ohio. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I'm going to end, end with this. I want you to time travel with me for a second, okay? Don't worry, no psychedelic drugs are necessary for this experiment, okay? I'll, I want you to go two months from right this exact second. Two months. Two months from now. Remember, it's roughly 4 o'clock, so let's go another three and a half hours. It's now 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time on November 5th. That's the place and time we're right now. All of you are watching Fox News. This does not strike me as a CNN crowd. All right? So you got Brett Baer at 7.30 in the dot. Breaking news. West Virginia has elected Jim Justice as the next Republican senator, which means the Senate is now 50. People are like, okay, I'm still nervous about the presidential, what's going on? Pennsylvania is still counting their first vote. <laughs> Detroit's trying to find a few more. <laughs> and these are facts. Um, now, if you do what I'm going to ask you to do, and we do it at scale, this is what's going to happen 20 minutes later. You ready, Lisa? 20 minutes later. So 7.50 p.m. Eastern time. Brett Baer will be talking about the election and what's going on. All of a sudden, he'll be like, what? What's that? Oh, wait, what? The breaking news, a little thing comes on the screen, right? And they say, we can now report, because of the early turning ballot numbers, that Bernie Marina has defeated serial politician Sharon Ryan. And, and the Republicans control the United States Senate. That's what they say. And the way we get there, the way we get there, the way we get to this, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I forgot the most important part. Two hours later, turn the channel, give me a favor, turn the channel, two hours later, 940, turn the channel. I know Diane in your house, CNN probably is banned. But two hours later, turn the channel, go to CNN, go to CNN, and watch grown men cry. <laughs> because they're gonna say, President Trump has been reelected. <laughs> This is what's going to happen on November 5th. So how do we get there? How do we get there? You leave here with a plan. Every, Senator Rubio said it perfectly. All of you know people that are not registered to vote. Every single one of you knows people that are not registered to vote. You have until October 7th to get them registered. Do whatever it takes to get them registered to vote. Get them in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the voting rolls. Then on October 8th, Lisa, what are you doing on October 8th? Yeah, well, voting. Yeah, voting. Right? Lisa's gonna, Lisa's gonna rent a bus, by the way. She's gonna drive in, alright? And she'll pick you up on her magic school bus. 
to take you to the polling booth to vote on October 8th. So your vote is done. Your vote is done. October 8th, your vote is done. Now all of you can say, I voted. It's done. Now, between October 8th and November 5th, find a person or two every single day. Of course, you can do that. Find a person every single day. Just one. Just one a day, two a day. Every day, find one or two people and drive them to go vote. And bank that vote early. Put up yard signs, pass out literature, make phone calls. Send out so many emails that your friends call you and say, stop sending me emails. <laughs> I want you to post so much on social media that your Mark Zuckerberg personally calls you and tells you to stop posting. That's how we're gonna win. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat. We have to do whatever it takes. Look, we have one shot. We have one shot to win this election. Look, I am not an alarmist. I am not hyperbolic, but I'm telling you, if in two months and four hours, Sherrod Brown wins it in the Senate, Kamala Harris wins it in the House and the White House, in one generation, this country will look like Venezuela. That's not hyperbole. Do you think that the people of Venezuela in 1998 thought any differently? In fact, Senator Rubio, can I ask, if you take what Chavez said in 1998, translate it to English, and compare it to the transcript from the DNC, you'll find a lot in common. That's where we're at, we're at this point. So you can't leave here without a plan to get it done. Look, about two months ago, President Trump was standing at a podium in Butler, Pennsylvania, and by the grace of God, turned his head ever so slightly, and literally dodged a bullet, not so for himself, but for the country. Because the country would not be the same today at that bullet struck. And he stood up and had the courage to send a message to every single one of us that we have to hear, which is that we gotta fight, fight, fight. Look, Mark, Senator Rubio said it beautifully. It's on us to know two months and a few hours from now that we did everything we could. Just know that Bridget and I will leave it all on the field. We got the magic, we got our little magic campaign bus out there. We're going to every corner of Ohio all day, every day. And as Lisa Stickin would say, because there's reporters here, some of you are reporting, to just say, I do not talk this way. That's the way Lisa Stickin would say, not me. He's been beating the crap out of me on TV for the last five months, all right? By the way, we went from 11 down in polls to up one. Pretty good, right? Mr. Kirk, you know what Lisa would say though? He, she would say that about a week and a half ago, we opened a can of whoop ass on Sharon Brown. All right, and now we're gonna have more TV ads than he does, and we're gonna absolutely highlight his record. We're gonna win this election. I need your help. Let's make it happen. Thank you, everybody.
Michigan or Ohio State fan? Uh, Ohio State because I live in Ohio. I did go to Michigan. Was it wasn't because I love Michigan. Because I want to be in the country. You want to be over here? Yes, you're over here. Yes, how are you? How are you? Okay, thank you for being here. Appreciate that very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to tell you, I wanted to tell you that Jane took out that Tim Lyon guy. Oh, yeah, I take out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, how are you? There's another one of you. You guys are multiplying. What do you mean? Well, I met Haley. I met. Samana, she's great. Samana's very nice. In Columbus, you speak Kayla. Your dramatic upgrade. Okay, so um, I'll have you stand like over here. Uh, that's that far away from you? I have to yell at you. All right. I remember I shot Joe Paganakis' retirement party oh, really? with this. I'm leaving the crappy uh, cameras. Uh, I know. Well, that's, it's amazing how the technology is evolved. It's like a hassle Although body. a multi-billion dollar company like uh, uh, Charter Communications, you figure you know, you give these, uh, you know, a camera person, a sound guy, you know? Oh, she's from Charter? Just for the record, can you just please state your first last name? Sure, it's Bernie Marina. And your title. I'm the Republican nominee for the United States Senate from Ohio. I actually answer the questions that are asked. I'm like sure if I'm to dodge every question because, again, he's used to being a career serial politician that has no accountability. All he can do is lie. All he can do is hide. All he can do is pretend he's something he's not. Well, that's all the questions I have for you today, unless there's anything else you'd like to say. Make sure you vote early. Vote on October 8th. Show up the selection. All right? Perfect. Let me meet you.